Tervetuloa studiossa ja teille vielä netin ääressä. Turun yliopiston tutkijakollegiumit luentosarja jatkuu. And uh, in English, University of Turku Collegia lecture series will continue. And today we welcome Matteo Rossi, who will speak on the subject of the era of quantum technologies. Um, research is the search for future. And uh, perhaps we will now also move a little bit into the future. But Matteo Rossi is the only one here in this room who will do it knows about that. So welcome. Okay, thank you. So uh, thanks for the introduction. And yeah, we will go a little bit in the, I mean, not so much in, to into the future because I will discuss things that will, will uh, are happening like nowadays. And uh, so my name is uh, Matteo Rossi. I am uh, I'm from Italy and uh, I'm a researcher here at the University of Turku since 2017. Uh, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher in the uh, Collegium for Science and Technology, and I work in the group uh, called uh, Quantum Technologies in the Department of Physics. And so, yeah, uh, let's say that, um, as I was saying, we are in, 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 uh, in a moment in which uh, we are developing, we're very close to develop uh, a new, uh, uh, a bunch of new technologies that have quantum physics uh, at their heart, uh, their heart. So my, maybe I'll move away from the screen. My, my goal in the lecture, in this lecture is to give you a bit of, uh, starting from the concepts and the phenomena that uh, uh, are uh, at the heart of quantum physics. Um, see how they are uh, going to be employed in, uh, in, uh, in these future technologies. And um, so let's start with, uh, with quantum physics. Uh, quantum physics is, a, um, is, the, is a theory that is now more than 100 year old. It was developed at the beginning of the 20th century to describe um, essentially the microscopic uh, world. So from molecules to down to atoms or even uh, single particles. Uh, such as electrons and, and so on. And uh, mm, it is somehow, uh, it was developed in order to explain some very weird phenomena that uh, were seen in experiments by, by physicists. And uh, it is also known in popular science to be a kind of complicated uh, and weird uh, subject in physics and probably uh, quotes like this one by Richard Feynman who was a famous physicist uh, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. They are probably quite uh, known uh, uh, even in, in a kind of popularized science and probably everyone knows uh, this uh, paradox of the Schrodinger cat, the cat that uh, lies in a box and it can be both dead and alive at the same time. These are all um, somehow enforce the idea that quantum mechanics is a bit of a weird uh, theory. Yet, uh, it is a theory that works very well. It predicts experiments uh, with a very high accuracy. And uh, it's been, of course, uh, improved. It has been developed for over 100 years. And nowadays, we are really uh, able to uh, you know, control uh, uh, quantum system, microscopic system very well, thanks to quantum mechanics. But um, one thing that is still uh, somehow uh, not clear even to physicists are how to interpret certain phenomena uh, and certain paradoxes. But here I, I will not deal with this interpretation of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics, but rather to the phenomena themselves that appear and now we, are, we can use them in, uh, for technological applications. So uh, I would like to start with a very a kind of a classic example in, in, uh, of an experiment in physics and uh, that reveals many of the features of, uh, of quantum mechanics, which is the double slit experiment. So it is a very uh, simple concept. You have a wall with uh, two slits separated by a short distance. 
then you have a screen on the back that will uh, uh, collect somehow uh, the things that we are going to throw against this wall. So we throw things at this wall and we look uh, what happens to them when they go uh, uh, across the wall. And uh, I want to start with the tennis balls. So we, let's put a tennis ball cannon in front of our wall, like the ones that are used for training uh, sessions. And let's see what happens. I mean, I think it's quite, uh, so here there's like a more uh, visual, more real uh, view of this experiment. So you see the, the, the wall with two slits and then a screen uh, behind it. And this is actually a video which shows what happens when, I, when we shoot tennis balls. As you might expect, some of the balls will hit the wall and bounce back. And then some of the uh, tennis balls will go through one of the two slits. Some of them might be a little bit deflected because they hit the slit in the border. But in the end, if you look at the points where they landed on the screen, you will see that there are two kind of bands where they uh, concentrate. Uh, and this is clearly the, the two bands behind the, the slit. So the balls will just go through this slit or this slit and accumulate here in these two bunches. OK, so here I think it's quite uh, nothing very much surprising. So in, uh, this is actually even before quantum mechanics, the, uh, a physicist uh, performed a double slit experiment using a light. The slits this time are, uh, will be quite uh, small and very close to each other. So we're talking about a fraction of a, a millimeter. and uh, what, what will appear here on the screen? Well, uh, one could think that light will just go a little bit through here, a little bit through here, and some of the light will bounce back. But this is not uh, exactly not what happens. I hope it's uh, visible. Uh, but uh, you see that there are not two bands, but there is like a bunch of bright spots uh, with some dim uh, areas uh, in between them. So this is completely different than the scenario of the tennis balls. And this is because, uh, as was then uh, discovered, is that uh, light behaves like a wave. So like the waves, uh, for example, in the water. So if you do this very same double slit experiment uh, in water with the, by kind of creating ripples on the surface, you will see that after the slide, after the, the slits, the two mm, there will be two kind of circular waves forming. And these uh, waves will form this like, geometric pattern here, which is called an interference pattern. So the two waves uh, kind of interfere with each other. And in particular, uh, it's a bit more visible in this other image. There will be areas in which basically the, the surface of the water is completely still, because the two, the, we say in physics that the two waves have destructive interference. So their, their effects on the, uh, the ripples cancel each other out. And there are other areas in which you, instead you see the ripples in the water. This is areas where we say there is constructive interference. And uh, so the, the, the projection somehow of this uh, interference pattern on the screen is what gives the, uh, this uh, this light pattern somehow. But then in the, uh, in the 20th century, uh, physicists have also done this experiment using uh, electrons. So they used uh, what is called an electron gun, which is actually a, mm, quite, uh, uh, it was somehow very common in the, maybe in the 90s when we had the old cathode ray tubes, uh, TVs. So these, the big TVs with the, um, uh, before the flat TV, TV, TVs came in. Uh, and all these TVs had basically at the back one of these electron guns. So if you take an electron gun and you somehow are able to control how many electrons are shot at once and you lower this down very little so that you're able basically to, uh, mm, to shoot individual electrons, you can repeat this experiment. And now the question is, what will happen? Do we have, uh, do we 
see electrons hitting the screen like tennis balls, or do we see them hitting the screen uh, like waves? So uh, the first experiment was done, was done in 1927, but I will, um, I will use a bit more recent uh, pictures from uh, an experiment in 1989. And here, again, I don't know, I hope it's visible also maybe in the streaming, but here you see some dots on the screen, and these are the individual electrons that hit our screen in the back. So it seems that these electrons are kind of like tennis balls. But we wait a bit more that more electrons hit the screen. Again, it seems like they are kind of tennis balls. But if we wait long enough so that we have enough collisions with the screen, we see that the, there is this uh, brighter bands and these uh, like more dim bands. So I I effectively, these electrons actually form the, inter the same interference pattern that uh, light formed and that uh, waves in water would form. And this is, the, this is somehow the, the first uh, paradox of quantum physics, which is that the individual, uh, so the electrons behave clearly as individual particles in the sense that they hit the screen uh, one at once in a specific point. So they, they, they look like tennis balls. Uh, and of course, being like tennis balls, uh, they will have, they, they will go either to one slit or the other, right? But they also form this interference pattern, like a wave. And so uh, it, must have, it must be the case that they actually went through both slit at the same time in order to uh, then interfere with themselves and, and, and show this interference pattern. And this is what is known as the quantum wave particle uh, duality. And this is essentially uh, a paradox somehow, and one would uh, be tempted to say, okay, but how about I check which way the electron went through? So how about I try to look at the electrons after they went past the slit before they, they hit the screen? And this is something that one can do. So one can put a detector, uh, some sort of, I don't know, photo detector or, or whatever device you can come up with that kind of checks behind uh, one of the two slits and emits, say, some sound or some beep or some light whenever an electron is caught after this slit. So then you say, OK, I will, I will see uh, whether the elect if the electron came from here, then it came from here. Otherwise, I assume that the electron passed from the other slit. The thing is, OK, you can do this. You could do this, and uh, you would see that more or less the, 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 your detector will beep half of the time. So it seems so that some of the electrons go through this slit, and some of the electrons go to this other slit, but not both slit at the same time. But in, if you look at the screen uh, while you are uh, checking the passage after this slit, you will only see two, ball, two bands here, like as if the electrons were tennis balls. So essentially, mm, the way uh, this brings in another uh, point in, uh, uh, in quantum mechanics, which is the fact that observing a quantum object uh, affects its state dramatically in the sense that uh, it loses uh, the it's a uh, wave-like properties, it's, it loses the interference. So the, the, the detector, detector here uh, made the part, the, the electron somehow uh, lose its wave-like properties, so it, we, we lost all the interference. And the, the, last, uh, the last point, that, uh, the last keyword that I, that I want to use is that in, uh, in quantum physics, when we want to say that an electron, for example, went through both slits at the same time, and which we don't know which one uh, it went through, we call, we call it a superposition state. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, if, uh, if I did the, this experiment with light using a very uh, dim source, like a laser, which emits a very small intensity of light, 
I could actually see that even light, okay, maybe not, not with this uh, light, but uh, I can see that actually light itself is made of individual particles which are called pho photons. And uh, uh, also light particles show this uh, kind of duality. So they are both particles and waves at the same time. So this is a short recap of the phenomena that uh, I want to describe. Uh, so we have the, the duality, so a particle uh, and wave-like properties at the same time. We have uh, the fact that uh, quantum objects can exist in superposition states, and this superposition state can then exhi exhibit interference. And the third concept is that the, uh, the, action, the, the effect of a measurement on a quantum system is that of destroying interference and superposition. The last uh, concept somehow that is uh, very important in quantum uh, physics is entanglement, but I will uh, not describe it so much because, uh, actually I will not talk about it at all because it's not so important for the following part of the of the lecture, although it's very, very interesting and, and very important. But I wanted to keep it somehow uh, a bit simple. Uh, so all these phenomena that are mm, kind of weird are actually uh, at the basis of a bunch of technologies that we use uh, all the time in, uh, in our lives which are, for example, lasers, like the one that I'm using right now, or all the semiconducting devices, so microchips in, uh, in computers, but also, for example, solar panels and so on, or uh, uh, magnetic resonance, like nuclear magnetic resonance, which is used in uh, medical imaging. These are all technologies that uh, were developed, developed knowing the effects of quantum mechanics. And we can call, consider these technologies as a kind of a first quantum revolution. The, um, the key of these, somehow, quant of these technologies is that the, uh, yes, they, they, they rely on quantum physics to work, but they uh, are characterized by the fact that there are many quantum objects uh, at once. So the, 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 the for example, in a laser, there are many of the photons, these lights of particle that are being created at once. In semiconductors, there's uh, uh, billions and millions and millions of electrons uh, flowing uh, in the devices. And in magnetic reson resonance, <coughs> we use uh, uh, all the spins, the magnetic spins of atoms uh, that are present, for instance, in the body. Uh, but now, in these years, we are uh, somehow developing a bunch of mm, technologies that are characterized instead by the possibility to control individual objects, individual quantum objects. So, for example, individual atoms, individual photons, and uh, individual electrons. And this, this opens up a, like a wide uh, uh, variety of options. Uh, for example, in communications, in particular in secure communication, so the, send, the sending <coughs> encrypted messages. Uh, this, will re this relies mostly on the fact that, as I was saying, the obser observing a quantum object will somehow affect its state. And so, for instance, if you want to send a message to some friend of yours uh, and someone tries to intercept this message, uh, the state of the message will be changed and you have ways to detect it. This is explained in a very uh, simplistic way, but this is the basis. We can use also uh, individual quantum objects for making very precise sensors, for instance, for magnetic fields or for uh, distances and so on. And finally, and this is what I would like to focus in the second part of the lecture, we can make uh, computers, we can make what, uh, what are called quantum computers. Um, so in, the, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, <clears throat> in this other part, I will explain how a quantum computer uses uh, the phenomena that I just introduced in the, in the first part. And uh, before I 
before I do this, I want to make one uh, explain, uh, make something clear. So the, um, we know that computers we, they, they have been invented, uh, let's say, in the 40s, and since then they have had a huge uh, progress in terms of somehow their size, speed, efficiency, and so on, uh, which is captured somehow empirically by this uh, law called Moore's law which says that every two years the numbers of transistors in a uh, chip doubles. So you see that there is uh, uh, kind of an exponential progress in the, uh, in the development of uh, computers. But uh, essentially, computers have been based on the very same concept uh, throughout all these uh, years, which is you have bits, so you have zeros and ones, you can uh, encode, for example, uh, big numbers or letters or whatever you want with bits. And then you can perform very simple operations like additions, multiplications. You can maybe do comparisons. And uh, <clears throat> what you want to do is to do these as fast as possible. So many millions of operations every second. And from that, you can make very complicated calculations. So the, the thing that I want to uh, somehow make clear is, oops, is that uh, quantum computers are not just the next step in this somehow uh, evolution, but they are, if you want a completely different architecture, they are a completely actually different uh, model of computation, uh, which you can say is kind of a choreographing of uh, quantum interference and superposition. And uh, before, uh, so now the plan is that I will explain more or less what are the basic ingredients and basic rules in a quantum computation. And then I will show an actual example of a, uh, a problem that you can somehow solve uh, with a quantum computer. So in order to do this, let's start with a coin, uh, like a regular coin. So you know that if you toss the coin and you repeat this many, many times, more or less half a percent of the, uh, half of the times you will have uh, your coin in heads, or half a percent of the times you will find the coin in tails. If you repeat this uh, tossing, and you again collect some uh, a bunch of uh, statistics, you will again find that the coin is half of the times in head and half of uh, the times uh, in tails. And this, you will agree with me, remains true if you toss the coin, you don't look at it, so you keep it in your hand without looking at it, and then tossing it again. You will, again, find that 50% of the times it's in heads and 50% of the times it's in tails. But now if you have a quantum coin, whatever that is, but let's say you have this quantum object that can be tossed or it can be quantum tossed, and then you look at it after the tossing, you will also find that it's 50% of the times in heads and 50% of the time in tails. And if you toss it or quantum toss it again, you will find it still 50% uh, of the times in heads and 50% of the time uh, in tails. Now, the interesting thing comes when you repeat the, the variation that I uh, presented before in which you toss or quantum toss and you don't look at the coin. Because now if you toss it, if you quantum toss it again, this is what you will find. So you start it from head and you will have 100% of the times head. And now to, uh, to describe this, uh, this phenomenon, uh, we have to introduce a new uh, concept which is what is called probability amplitude. So you know probabilities are uh, define something uh, that we are not sure about. They are, they are basically going from zero to percent, so something that never happens, to 100%, so something that happens all the time. And in the case of a coin toss, it's 50-50. Uh, probability amplitudes are a bit different in the sense that they, okay, you can still have things, uh, states, in which uh, heads, happens all the time, or tails happens all the time. But then you have a superposition state, 
but you can also have negative probability amplitude. So this is another uh, superposition state in which the probability amplitude here is negative. And, uh, and however, whenever you look at your quantum system, let's say that this is the state of your quantum system, so it's this superposition state with some negative probability amplitude, the, the measurement will make them uh, transform these into probabilities. And essentially, the height of these bars is what will give you the probability uh, of measure uh, when you perform the measurement. So from this state, you will find 50% that your coin is in heads and 50% that your coin is in tails. Now, what happens with this uh, quantum toss is that if your coin is in head and you quantum toss it, you end up with this superposition state of heads and tails. It's a bit like the electron going through both slits at the same time. And if you quantum toss a coin which is uh, in the tails state, you end up with this other superposition state with ne uh, negative probability amplitude. Now, uh, what happens when you do twice the quantum toss? So the first quantum toss, we started from head, and we end up with this, probability, with this uh, superposition state. The second toss, we'll have to, we have to uh, first consider what happens to this head uh, state in the superposition, which again is transformed like this. But then the tails in this superposition uh, after the Q-toss will look like this. But now because these, this coin was already in a superposition state, interference will happen, just like in the uh, electron going through the both slits. And when there is interference, what will happen is that uh, probability amplitudes with the same direction, so these are both positive, will uh, uh, sum up. So we will have constructive interference. When they are in the opposite uh, direction, we have destructive interference. So in, uh, it's a bit like the, the, the waves in the, in, the, in the lake. So in the end, the final state after the second quantum toss is a state where all the probability amplitude is in the add uh, state of our coin. Oops. So whenever we measure this state, so we look at the state of our quantum coin, all this probability amplitude will actually correspond to the probability of observing the coin in heads. Now, uh, what? Uh, okay. So now I will uh, uh, go to the problem that we would like to solve uh, with a quantum computer. And the problem is, is this one. Uh, we want to find the correct password, uh, knowing that uh, our password has uh, four digits and the, the digits are only zeros and ones, so they are like bits. This is not, of course, a very secure password because in total you can see that there are only 16 possibilities. <clears throat> but um, if we increase the number of digits, so let's say we put 128 digits, then the number of possibilities become very large. And these 128 digits, uh, if we consider that you usually need like eight bits for uh, encoding a character, so like a letter or a uh, symbol or whatever, this is a 16 uh, character password. So when you have a 16 character password, this is the number of possibilities that you have. So that's why uh, you are encouraged to use long passwords in uh, websites and so on. Uh, but OK. Now, if you have a, a computer and you want your computer to uh, somehow find this correct password, the only thing that you can do is to try all these one at a time, right? until you find the uh, one that uh, is correct. So in the worst case, you have to try all the 16 possibilities here, or all these uh, billions of billions of billions of, of possibilities if you have a longer password. But now, uh, 
let's, uh, let's consider a quantum computer. So a quantum computer is essentially uh, made of a quantum version of a bit. Uh, a bit can be in a zero or in a one. A quantum bit is a bit like the, the, the quantum coin that I showed before, which could be heads or tails or some superposition of heads and tails. So our quantum bit, which we usually call qubit to uh, abbreviate, can be a zero, a one, or any superposition of zero and one. So something described by these probability amplitudes. Two qubits <coughs> can be uh, in a superposition of all the possible four states, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And again, we, they can be described by these four probability amplitudes and so on. Uh, of course, whenever uh, you look at your qubits, or so whenever you observe them, these probability amplitudes will become probabilities. So you will, here you will find, for instance, your qubit to be zero more times than you will find it to be one. So for, uh, for our um, uh, finding the password example, which by the way is called Grover's search algorithm. Grover was a, is a computer scientist that uh, developed this algorithm in the, uh, in the 90s. We, we are going to need uh, four qubits. So our four qubits can in principle exist in any superposition of all their 16 uh, combinations. We will uh, need one more ingredient, which is uh, the oracle. So the oracle in computer science is something that tells you if uh, uh, whether you, your, the, the attempt that you're making at finding the answer is correct or not. So let's suppose that 0011 is our uh, correct password. So the oracle will tell you, OK, this is the correct answer, or it will tell you, no, this is the wrong answer if you try something else. In our quantum computer, we're going to need uh, an oracle that uh, what this oracle will do is flipping the probability amplitude of the correct state. So if it was positive, it will be flipped to negative. And now uh, let's see how this uh, Grover algorithm works. The first step is uh, creating a superposition of all the 16 states. Uh, all with equal probability amplitudes. And this, this is actually very simple to do. You do, essentially, you do a quantum toss for each of the qubits, the, the operation that I described before. And uh, remember that this one is the, the correct answer that we consider. <clears throat> the next step is apply the oracle. So uh, ask the oracle to look at our uh, our qubit state and flip the uh, amplitude of the correct state. So the oracle will do it. Notice that, okay, it's not that we're done now because if we now measure the, our qubits, these probability amplitudes are, become probabilities. So fact, the fact that they are negative, we, we, we're not be able to see it. So we, we won't notice any difference between these 16 uh, these different 16 states. So we need another step, which is what is called amplitude amplification. And this amplitude amplification works a bit, uh, it's a bit uh, involved, to, but if, uh, I will just ex tell you what's the effect. I have some slides later to explain how it, it's actually operating, but somehow what, what it does is consider the mean of these probability amplitudes which, because this one is negative, will be a bit lower than, the, than these other ones. Now what this amplitude amplification does is reflecting all these amplitudes around this mean. So the result is something like this. And now you see that the, the correct answer now has a much higher probability amplitude than the other ones. <clears throat> and this we will uh, now be able to measure, because now when we measure our uh, four qubits, we will find them more often in the correct state. And I can actually show you, I did this uh, with a simulator of a quantum computer. This is an, in, indeed the case that you will find the correct answer 50% of the time, more or less. 
So essentially, instead of brute forcing, so instead of trying all the possible password, we kind of made some uh, choreography in which we amplified the probability of the correct answer. And the, the interesting thing is that uh, we can repeat this again, and we can increase our probability of finding the right answer, because this was, this was uh, what we had after the, the first uh, iteration. We invoke the oracle again, and it will flip the amplitude of the correct answer. Then we can apply amplification again. The mean was something like here, maybe. And now the height of this probability amplitude is even higher. And if now I run the, the simulation again, I will find that the, the, the correct answer will come out of my measurement 90% uh, of the time, more or less. And I can go on and on. And uh, what is interesting is that, um, although this seems kind, uh, kind of complicated, it is, it, is, it is worth doing so rather than trying all the passwords at once, because uh, if these are the number of attempts that you have to make with a standard computer, so one by one, one can see that these are the numbers of uh, iterations that you need to do with uh, your quantum computer in order to have a sufficiently high probability. And uh, if you look at the number of zeros and how they increase, you see that here they increase much, uh, kind of, the increase is much lower. Here we add one zero at once, where here there are two zeros at once added. So we say in, uh, in computer science, it says that the, the quantum algorithm has a better uh, scaling or a better complexity, which means that this is a, like somehow something that is very, uh, important in computer science when your algorithm uh, scales better than another one, it means that even with the same computer, you will be able to uh, run it on much bigger problem. So the, the somehow uh, the core points here are that the calculation in, uh, in our quantum computer are uh, really fundamentally different than in a and in a regular computer, we are not adding or, or multiplying bits. We are not comparing them. We are just uh, applying, applying quantum superposition and interference in a clever way in order to get something out of the state of our qubits when we measure them. And all these algorithms uh, developed for quantum computer do not seem to have a, an equivalent uh, algorithm somehow with a that works with a regular computer. And quantum computing algorithms have been developed uh, somehow theoretically for at least 30 years. And they cover a bunch of applications that are like, somehow very important. So the search problems that I presented, but also optimization problems that apply to finance, logistics, and so on. <clears throat> Simulations uh, of molecules, for instance, for development of drugs and, and, and uh, medicines, or new materials, more materials that are more efficient under whatever thermal or energetic uh, uh, requirements, but also for artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. So they are uh, being so somehow uh, potentially important for applications. The research in quantum computers have been, has been a very uh, somehow fast, <clears throat> and uh, we are now at the point in which actually we have quantum computers, more or less, uh, and they are developed even by big companies like Google, for example, or IBM. So this is, uh, this is Google's CEO next to uh, Google's quantum computer. It doesn't look very comfortable. But, uh, and actually, this, this is not uh, the quantum computer itself. This is just a huge fridge which is called dilution refrigerator. The actual quantum computer is, uh, it looks a bit like a regular CPU of a uh, regular computer. It is hidden somewhere here in, in all this mess of cables. So all this big fridge is needed to uh, cool this chip at very low temperatures, basically close to, very close to the absolute zero. So, Besides Google, there are also other big companies like IBM who are developing 
uh, quantum computers. This is, so this is the fridge. It's a very similar fridge to the other one when it's closed. And then liquid helium is usually uh, pumped in there. Uh, IBM also allows uh, people to try their quantum computers from, from the internet uh, using basically they are on the cloud. Uh, and this is how these uh, chips look like in, uh, in details. Uh, and essentially, we need to cool them down uh, at these very low temperatures because we want them to become superconducting. So superconductivity is this state of matter that uh, is exhibited by some materials at very low temperatures in which uh, essentially they don't offer any more uh, resistance to the flow of currents. And so we have these kind of microchips that have uh, uh, some, uh, they're basically made in, in an identical way as a regular CPU, but they have these things, these square uh, boxes here. They are our qubits. And then we have a bunch of other connection paths and, and things that allow us to measure their outcome. Uh, so this, this is the technology that, for, for instance, IBM is using or Google is using, and it's not the only, uh, the only possibility. You can also use uh, ions, so uh, atoms that are charged. Uh, you can create some ion traps by uh, applying certain electromagnetic fields, and you can have your own little atoms or like on a line, and then you can uh, make them behave as if they were qubits. And this is, uh, this is, for instance, research by other big companies like Honeywell or uh, other startups. And finally, you can even use the particles of light, so photons, and you can make uh, uh, computations out of them. And this, uh, there is a startup in Canada who's doing that. Uh, all these different technologies are somehow, um, at this point, uh, uh, they have pros and cons, and there's no, uh, not a clear winner of uh, which technology will, uh, will somehow become the final quantum computer. What is clear is that the pace at which they are progressing is quite uh, impressive. So this, for example, is the roadmap of IBM, which was presented in September. So this is the current state. It's a quantum computer with 65 qubits. But they plan on having uh, 1,000 qubits in, uh, in, uh, in three years. Um, but this is only one direction somehow of, uh, of research, because there is a, a fundamental problem, and I will show you now. So this was the simulation of the Grover algorithm uh, after one iteration, so the correct answer was given by, uh, as an outcome, half of uh, the times, 50% of the times. But then I, uh, I tried to run this on one of the IBM quantum computers that, uh, that you can use for free on, on, on the internet. Well, this is the result. So the probability of getting the right answer is only a bit less than 10%. So these computers essentially uh, uh, have a problem. And the, the, the problem is that quantum systems, so creating a quantum system in a superposition state, and then uh, letting it be in this superposition state uh, is uh, very difficult, because it's very fragile. And it will somehow be affected by all possible sources of uh, noise and disturbance in the environment. For example, atoms, photons, whatever there is uh, uh, in, uh, in your uh, quantum computer. And this is called uh, decoherence in, uh, in technical jargon. And basically, what this implies is that the probability amplitudes that we create uh, when we create the superposition state quickly become regular probabilities. So we lose all these uh, effects that we were employing for our algorithm. And this is somehow a, a limiting factor. And this is why the computers that we have nowadays, which have 
which are small and they have very few qubits, they are also very noisy. They also somehow allow for very short calculation. And this Grover algorithm that I've shown is out of reach. So they are basically completely useless, let's say, at this point. But of course, the, the progress is uh, really fast. Uh, both on the size, so the number of qubits, but also on the, the robustness, let's say, the, 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 the uh, resilience to all this noise. And also on the theoretical sides, there are many advances, for instance, in finding algorithms that are somehow uh, a bit more, uh, work a little bit well even in presence of the coherence. And uh, somehow there is, there is a keyword that Maybe uh, you have also read from the news, which is this quantum supremacy. These are actually news from one year ago, almost exactly. So Google claimed to have demonstrated quantum supremacy. And what this means is it's explained actually well in the Finnish title. Uh, this is the Helsing in Sanoma title from one year ago, uh, which says that basically this, uh, the quantum computer that Google has, which I showed you before, uh, has been able to run in 200 seconds a calculation that would have taken 10,000 years on a supercomputer, according to them. Then this is debated somehow, but the point is that this quantum supremacy is uh, somehow the point at which you will, uh, you have a quantum computer that does something that no supercomputer in the world is able to do uh, in a, in like quickly enough for you to wait for the result. And this is uh, what the Google did was to invent some very uh, convoluted problem, some very academic problem uh, that was somehow made on purpose to be easy to do on a quantum computer. It doesn't have any useful application, but it was a, a kind of a proof of principle that quantum computers are actually uh, a capable of things that other computers are not doing. Now what people are expecting in the next couple of years, maybe even in the next year, is that actually there will be uh, some useful application in which a quantum computer, like the ones that I showed, uh, will be uh, performing better than a, than a supercomputer. And uh, I have a, a couple, few more slides, I'm almost done, but somehow this was to, this is a, uh, slide that recaps what we actually researching in the group of quantum technologies. And uh, it, so we are uh, experts in, uh, in, um, in what is called theory of open quantum systems, which is exactly the description of the effects of the environment on a, on a, um, on a quantum system. So how much, uh, so uh, the description of how this uh, noise uh, induces the coherence and this also gives uh, ideas on how to fight the coherence. Then we are also looking at some of the, the, the measurement part of, uh, of quantum computers, and in particular, on uh, uh, it's called tomography, so ways to reconstruct uh, the state of qubits in a, in a computer for characterizing them. And we are looking at uh, near-term algorithms, so algorithms that somehow work well also in, uh, in noisy devices. And these are some of the teams that I more or less directly involved in, but then we also have more fundamental research uh, going on. Uh, I also have another slide, which is instead uh, more about Finland and quantum technologies in Finland. So uh, there is a, many, a lot of investments are uh, being done both from the public level. For instance, the Academy of Finland is, fin is uh, financing a center of excellence, which is a joint center of excellence between the University of Alto, VTT, and the University of Turku, so our group. There are companies, uh, there is a startup uh, called IQM that is developing uh, the hardware for uh, superconducting quantum computers. There's Blue Force, which is a company that be, builds these big refrigerators and sells them to companies, uh, even including, I think, Google and IBM. And then there is also a a small startup that, uh, which we, f we founded, I myself included, uh, in, uh, here in Turku that is developing software, software algorithms for quantum computers. And I am 
I'm done with the lecture. I only have a, an advertisement, which is uh, now if you want to uh, learn uh, a bit more about quantum physics and quantum technologies, but uh, you cannot stand boring lectures like mine, uh, we are launching, together with uh, Professor Maniscalco and some members of the team, uh, Qplay Learn, which will be a, some sort of uh, learning platform. Uh, explaining concepts of quantum physics uh, using multimedia, in particular using games. So, to, you know, quantum physics is a bit uh, difficult to understand at, at, at first, and using games sometimes will uh, help uh, familiarizing with the concepts. And uh, it's under development, and there will be an official launch on the 14th of December. In, uh, in, at the Tiede Kuhlmann in, Hel in Helsinki, and also uh, streaming live. And uh, this is it, and thank you for your attention. And I'll just leave a, oops, a slide here with some other resources, if in case someone's interested. So thank you. It was not boring. Uh, okay. Difficult uh, thing, <laughs> so it has to be a little bit difficult, but that's not boring. Okay, very uh, good. But uh, uh, there are problems, you say, about this and uh, disturbances and so on. And for example, now in Finland we have had this uh, leak of uh, people's personal information and, and health information from a company called Watson. So you, would you say that if uh, Already, when we have those problems, you, you told us. Uh, so, if you use quantum computers, can they could it be more easily to disturb them or hack them? Than uh, it's a very it's a very good question. And uh, uh, let's say, okay, for what quantum computers are uh, concerned, somehow at the moment there is no. Uh, so the, the first uses of quantum computer will not somehow be privacy uh, sensitive in the sense that they will be used for uh, maybe optimization problems and so on, and not for storing personal information. <clears throat> One thing that though quantum physics allows for, which is called quantum cryptography, is actually a better way to encrypt information and codify it using, uh, uh, there are a, a bunch of, uh, um, protocols that have been developed to securing and exchanging secure data. And this has, has, has to do with, the, for instance, quantum measurement, the fact that when you try to look into someone's message, you're actually perturbing it by looking at it. So actually quantum, quantum cryptography and so on will, will give a better uh, way of protecting data. Although uh, it is somehow, one thing is the, uh, technology, which is, uh, we already have very secure technology. One thing is the correct use of it. So that is, of course, the biggest problem, I think, even in this uh, case that happened here in Finland, how you use what you already have as a technology. But of course, the, uh, let's say at, at this point, no one has thought of how hackable quantum computers have been, because somehow they are so uh, small that <laughs> They are kind of useless, right, at this point. But uh, it's an interesting question. So what will happen when a quantum computer needs a lot of cold, a very, very cold environment? Mm. And there will be a cut in energy, so uh, you, you, <laughs> you lose the cold you need. So what will ha happen then with a quantum computer? Well, essentially, you, what, uh, what will happen is that you will lose it. You will, uh, when you increase the temperature, somehow you increase even more this disturbance. And of course, it will make it uh, impossible to perform any calculations. Yeah, but I mean, then if you recover the, the cold environment, so will it start again from continue or...? or no, no, of course you, have to, you will have to restart the calculation uh, uh, from scratch. Uh, but you, 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 
you have to think of a quantum computer at the moment as something that can be used, let's say, uh, it will not be something that works on its own, let's say. It will be something that performs maybe a, a very specific calculation together with another computer that is uh, controlling it. So it will just uh, somehow accelerate some uh, parts of your calculations for now. Then maybe in the future we will have uh, quantum computers that can be turned off and on and will recover from their state and so on. For now, uh, actually, this, uh, all these big uh, things, all these messy things, they basically need to be turned off and on every day and they have to be recalibrated in order to uh, run somehow at a decent level of precision. So we are still very at the, we are kind of at the level of the, you know, the very big supercomputers that they had in the 40s, these this huge rooms that in the end they were basically like calculators yeah. and they would break all the time. So it's, uh, you use it just for doing a work, like a calculator, but it doesn't store anything. No, there. it's actually storing things is uh, uh, the so-called quantum memory. So storing states in a, in a superposition, for example, is a very uh, difficult th task and it's actually an open research question how to keep superposition states uh, in memory. So for now, all the, all the let's say, algorithms that exist uh, for quantum computers, they kind of do not require any memory. They run just like yeah. you give an input and they process it and give you an output. And then you have to store it some, some uh, in other ways. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like a calculator, but exactly, but, but a, a very, very fast one, one, a very clever one. Clever. Okay. Any questions? Uh, in, in your slide, you, you, you said, uh, and, and, and it is uh, common to say that. Um, uh, Microelectronics is an uh, application of, of quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, it is a historical fact, of course, that uh, Sophie and the others uh, knew quantum theory of, uh, of solids. But uh, do, do you think that uh, they, they could uh, discover, say, transistor uh, without doing any quantum mechanics? Uh, if, if you compare, for instance, the uh, first applications of, uh, of electricity, they, they didn't know Maxwell equations and, and, and all, all that. Uh, they, they just made things and, 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 and so and, uh, and empirical, empirically. But what do you think? What, what is your, I know that you are a, a, a software fellow, but but what is your opinion about transistor? I think, uh, I mean, of course, everything is possible, but I think it would have been very difficult to kind of discover it without uh, all the somehow knowledge <coughs> uh, of uh, quantum mechanical effects that, uh, that was done in the previous decades, because somehow the whole uh, semiconductor uh, physics is heavily relying on, for instance, energy gaps between uh, conduction state and um, insulation state. So there is a lot of uh, uh, very kind of, mm, how do you say, somehow the, 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 the steps that one needs from like starting from some silicon to actually end up uh, having a transistor, which include, for instance, uh, doping parts of the silicon with other metals and so on. Uh, I don't think one would have just by chance found them uh, very easily. So my, my opinion is that somehow uh, it's been fundamental in this, in this sense. But of course, uh, as you were saying, electricity, which is somehow, somehow a very difficult mm, physical effect, has been kind of found a bit by chance. But let's say from, from saying okay, I found electricity from two saying I, I have a, a piece of silicon. I, I know where to put some very specific metals in very specific points in order to create the electronic uh, the, um, uh, structure of the 
energy landscape of my material in order to have uh, these effects. I think it's a bit difficult that it would have happened. Any other questions? I bet that we are quite satisfied. Okay. So thank you, Matteo. Thank you. For it. Please.